nanohub.org. So to start Kite, whether you're on the 4200 or on a desktop, you go to the, come on, there it is. Go to the Keithley Instruments program, and here's all the things that we talked about. The complete reference, initialize new user, KCON, Kite, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So let's start Kite. This is Kite Desktop version 8 for the PC. Now, Kite, of course, is normally looking for internal instrumentation, but there is no internal instrumentation here. So I actually can't execute anything here, but I can go and define tests, save tests, and I can look at data. Okay. So this is our project navigator. This is our multi-document interface, and this is our message console. I currently have four tests open on the multi-document interface. And I can cycle through those tests by clicking the, the tab. So when I click the Pulse VDS ID test, it makes that test dominant in the window and puts it into my test execution window up here in the upper left-hand corner. Yes, we have a question. Yeah, you should adjust the window. We can see the top part of it. So oh. When you go up there. Uh, projector problem? I think it's a projector. But, but I think what I can do is shrink it just a little bit. Okay. So now we're a little less than full screen, but at least you can see. So when I click on the tab, it makes that test active and puts it into this test execution window. Remember when I click the green run button, whatever's in the test execution window will execute. Once it's running, whatever's in the test execution window is what is currently executing. Remember I can run a sequence from here. So the test execution window will always give me the status of what's currently executing. That status also shows up down here in the status area down here. So this is our default project, which I can see has been modified from the standard default project. There is a subsite under the default project, which is named subsite, very creative. And under that, we have a four terminal NFET device of which we have a variety of tests. Let's go look at a test. Here is the VDS ID test. I double clicked it, it opened it, it put it in focus in the multi-document interface, and it put it up in the execution window. I can briefly view the test definition. I can click on the sheet and see that this test has been executed before and is full of data. I can click on the graph and see that that data has been graphed. I can click on the status button and see that this test is configured and executable. There is no problems with this test. And this is a new tab that we've just added, I think with Kite 7.2, which is what we call test notes. So now you can actually come in here and you have a place to put notes on the test if you want to keep notes. Okay, so here's an important lesson. I pop up the test and I come up here and I click the run button and the test goes out to execute. Remember that we're on the desktop, so this test can't actually execute here, but it pretends it's executing, okay? As soon as I click the run button, the test immediately goes and erases the data sheet. The old data's gone, okay? but it's not gone forever, right? It's only in a temporary file. If I come up here and I close this test, it will say, I've detected new data. Do you want me to save that new data for the VDS ID? 
This is my last chance. If I say no, it will close that test, but it will discard the old data and, sorry, it will discard the new data and retain the old data. This happens frequently. People will pull a project or a test up, they'll look at the test, they'll hit the run button, and they'll go, oh, I forgot, I wanted that old data. It's not gone. We don't ever overwrite old data without warning you. If you go look at the data, you'll see the new data, but if you close the test, it'll warn you, I haven't saved the new data yet, and now your old data will come back. So we open VDS ID again, take a look at the sheet, we see the old data, we see the graph. It's an important point. So we always warn you before we overwrite old data. <clears throat> Notice, um, if I uncheck the checkbox, I can't execute this test. This is a common problem. The test has to be selected in the checkbox to make it executable. Now, <clears throat> if I were to choose the four terminal NFET, go up to the device, go up one level to the device level. In fact, I can even shrink it, shrink everything down, right? So now all I can see is device level. If I choose the device level, you'll see that I'm at a device plan of a four terminal NFET. That's what we'll execute next. If I click the run button, it will go out and run the VDS ID test. Then it will run every other test. Now it's running the sub VT test. Next it runs the MOSFET test. Now it's running the pulse test. Now it's running waveform measure. And now it's done. So we actually went and executed everything that was in these check boxes here. But we haven't saved them yet. So if we really didn't mean to do that, if we, if we go to close this project, it'll tell me there's a whole bunch of data in here that hasn't been saved yet. Do you want me to save it? All right. And if we say no to all, all the old data comes back to life. So we closed that project. We're now sitting here with no projects, no tests. We have no way to test. We're starting from a blank screen. Somebody mentioned earlier, this is like the most confusing, complicated part of the 4200. I've got a blank screen. How do I, how do I test anything? Well, if I'm starting from scratch, I'm going to go to File, New Project. It will bring up my new project window, which I'm going to call, this is Lee's test project. By default, it's going to put me into the KI user project subdirectory, but I can choose any subdirectory I want. And I can also set up the number of sites, initialization and termination steps if I want. There's my project. It's an empty project I still can't test but I can add a subsite. I'm going to be creative and call my new subsite a subsite. So now I have a subsite, but I still can't test. So I come over here and select a device. I'm going to grab a, what do we got here? A two terminal miscap. So now I have a device. It's a metal insulator semiconductor capacitor, but I still can't test. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to add a new test. This is going to be my CV sweep. CV sweep. There we go. Now I have a test. Now I can open my test and I see I have a blank definition. There's nothing in this test. Just because I called it a CV sweep, it didn't have any knowledge as to what that meant, right? So now I can come in here and I can say, look, I want you to add the CV high terminal here. Boop. And I want you to add the CV low terminal over here. Except I clicked it wrong and I entered a SMU number four. So now I got a CV high and a SMU number four attached here. Right? And so I'm going to come over here and set up my CV settings. And it basically tells me, wait a minute, you haven't selected a CV high and low. CV requires high and low. Right? You made a mistake somewhere, go figure it out. 
Oh yeah, well I actually meant this to be CV low. There we go. So now we got CV high and low tied across this device. All right. Now I can go in here and actually see my CV settings. Now this is this is sort of new and unique to CV. This is the first time an instrument actually has a CV setup screen that is virtually identical to the IV setup screen. All right. We can come in here, we can do CV constant bias, the CV voltage sweep, we have the CV custom list sweep, or we have the CV frequency sweep. The frequency sweep we discussed earlier, so I'll go ahead and pop into that. I can come up and I can set up all my different settings. I can see my frequency sweep at a constant bias, which is three volts pre-soak and two volts, and it's going to run from one kilohertz to one megahertz. That gives me 28 data points, and it's going to be at 30 millivolts RMS. Okay. Okay, my CV sweep is set up. So I come over to my CV low side and I, wait a minute, I can't set up anything on CV low. Why is that? Well, CV high and low um, is required. You have to have CV high and CV low. So we just put all the CD settings in CV high. We didn't make us click between the two of them. Okay. So all the settings are in CV high. But I don't have a green run button. My first problem is I've created a brand new test and I haven't saved it. So let's come over here and do the save test. Click. And now I have my green run button. So now I should be able to come to my sheet, come to my graph, define my graph, say I want on the x-axis, the parallel capacitance, and on the y-axis, the DC voltage. Click OK. When I hit Run, it should pour the data in here automatically. Of course, I don't have any, uh, don't have any data because I don't have any instruments. Hmm. That actually put data in there. Oh. DC voltage is zero. <laughs> so I just plotted zero versus the entire curve. So let's plot it versus something else. Oh, this was a frequency sweep. Silly me, DC voltage was at zero. So what I have to do is come in here and plot CP versus frequency. I want X, X axis, I want frequency. There we go. Then I can auto scale it. So there, it's just simulated data. It's just a CV curve with simulated data versus frequency. In fact, I happen to know that this particular simulated data is <clears throat> actually a CV curve. So I'm going to come to my X axis and make it logarithmic. So it actually looks like a CV curve. Remember, we swept across a log, a log set of frequencies here. So here's our frequency versus capacitance, capacitance curve. Now, literally, I only touched about 10% of the input fields. In most cases, when you're creating a new test, that's all you need to touch. You know, about 10% of the input fields are good enough. Okay. So, to recap, I started a new project by clicking File, New Project. Then I added a subsite by clicking the subsite button. I added a CV device by clicking the device button. And I added an ITM, brand new empty ITM, by clicking the ITM button. I can add another one. Let's make this an IV sweep. Never mind my spelling. So here's my IV sweep. Completely empty test, but you notice it's the same device, right? So I'm going to put SMU number one here, and I'm going to put SMU number two here. So now I can actually <clears throat> um, measure both the current going in and coming out of this device. But I really don't want to do that. What I really want to do is a sampling mode test. 
This is a, this is hold a constant voltage and measure versus time. Click on the force measure window. You'll see my forcing functions are now limited. I can, I can't do any more sweeps now. I'm in sampling mode. I could have a current bias or I could have a voltage bias, right? So I can set it to one volt and I can come over here and I can say, I want you to measure the current. So I want you to be a voltage bias at zero volts and measure the current on a limited auto range 100 pico amp. Okay, happy with that. So this is a sampling mode test. Where do I set up how many samples and my time interval? How do I set that up? Anybody volunteer for answer to that? Window. Right. It's not set up in the biasing function window, it's set up in the timing window. So in the timing window, I set up my interval for my sampling mode. I set up how many samples I want, maybe a hundred, and how much time I want at the beginning of the sweep. I don't need any hold time at the beginning of the sweep. Notice by default, the time stamp is turned on. Oops. Oh, I got to have some hold time, zero. Okay. Now my timing's set up, but I don't have a green run button because I didn't save it. I save it and I have the green run button. Now I can run the test. We'll go out, acquire the data, fill the sheet, and then I can graph it. Okay. Yeah, the sheet, the sheet's a fun thing. Remember I told you this sheet, it's a lock sheet. I'm trying to fudge my data. I don't like that first data point. I want to adjust it. <laughs> I can't do it, all right? The data is protected. However, I could copy this data by right clicking on it, copy it over here to the calc sheet by pasting it in here. Now I can do whatever I want to the data in the calc sheet, okay? Notice when I come back to my graph, when I go to my define graph, now all the data in my data sheet and all the data in my calc sheet is available to be graphed. So this is a very clever way of overlaying data from one test to another test. Remember separate tests are separate, but maybe I ran one test, created a separate test, maybe it's a new device and I want to compare the results. I can copy the data from one and paste it in the calc sheet of another. And that gives me a nice way to quickly overlay the data and compare the results from two different devices or something. The calc sheet's a really nice scratch pad for fooling around with stuff. There's, um, I can get the graph menu up by right clicking any blank area of the graph. If I right click on a device or an element, I get that element. This is the axis properties element. Okay. Uh, let me throw some data up here. Uh, X versus current. Let's see what that gives us. I don't know. Do we have any? Let me see what our data is here. Hmm. It's all zero. That's pretty boring data. Let's go something, something that has more interesting data. <clears throat> Back to our CV sweep. Um, if I point at the actual curve, when I hit a data point, it'll turn into an arrow and it'll show me the data point. All right? But I don't have data points everywhere. If I right click on the data, I can turn on a shape, say a dot, and now I see the actual data points, right? So now I see where data was actually acquired. Until I did that, it was just kind of a smooth, idealized curve. And now I can point at any one of those data points and it will give me the actual data of that data point. <clears throat> if I right click and turn on the cursors, I can turn on as many cursors as I like I can set up the property of the cursors and then I can drag the cursors around and have them display for me.
wherever I want them to display for me. So the cursors give me a nice readout. If I want to save the graph, I right click, click the save as, and now I can dump this graph out of the kite environment in bitmap, JPEG, or whatever, and it's a full high resolution graph. So if you put it onto a high resolution printer or something, you'll get higher resolution than the screen resolution of the instrument. All right, so I've got a CV sweep and an IV sweep defined for this particular device. And if I clicked on two terminal miscap and hit the run button, it'll go run both of those in the, in the order they're in. But I don't want them in that order. I want to reverse the order. I want to change the order. Okay. So what I'd like to do, I wish what I could do is right click on this and say, change the order or select it or move it or drag it or do something. I can't do that. In order to manage it, I have to open the device. This is called my device window. Now I've got all my tests in here. I can take the CV sweep, move it down, hit the apply button, and it changed the order for me. So if I want to manage the, dev the tests under the device, I have to actually open the device window. The left pane is the execution sequence. The right pane is the user library. So maybe I want to go grab a test out of my default user library and put it onto my two terminal mis misfit. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to come grab a resistor test, two terminal resistor test. And I'm going to copy it. And it says to me, this test cannot be added because you're trying to add a resistor test to a MISFET device. They have different terminal names and I don't know what to do with it because I base all of my connections on the terminal name and I base all of my data on the terminal name. So terminal names matter here. That's one of the reasons I really like the generic terminal because it's named A, B, C, D, E. <laughs> so whatever you drag in there, if it's got an A, B, C, D, E, it'll attach it to a generic terminal. But our miss, our miss devices have gates and drains and sources, right? Our resistors have, have a cathode and an anode. Our diodes have a cathode and an anode. Those things are not interchangeable. I can't take a resistor test and drop it on my miss cap. Okay. <clears throat> Although I could probably take a capacitor test and drop it over there. Nope, can't do that either. Oh, because a capacitor is anode and cathode, and a miscap is not anode and cathode, it's gate and substrate. But it allowed me to copy a user test module. So an interactive test module <clears throat> is is got this little family of curves icon, and a user test module has this little kind of C programming icon. <clears throat> All right. A user test module, remember, <clears throat> doesn't have a device in it. If we pull a user test module up, it's a direct interface to a C dynamic link library. So all I get to do is pass parameters in and pass parameters out of that C dynamic link library. There's no pretty little picture, nothing to limit this device. So this particular user library that I just pulled in from my standard libraries is the Keithley 590 user library. That's Keithley's old high frequency CV meter. It's called a CV analyzer actually. And the particular module is the C measure 590 module, which the first thing it asked me for is the cable compensation file. This was the problem we discussed earlier where you don't have those cable compensation files available for your instrument because you don't have the cable compensation capacitors anymore, right? <clears throat> the next thing it asked me for is which C meter do I want to talk to? Well, right here, it's predefined with C meter number one. Well, how do I know if my 590 is C meter number one? Right, the answer is I told it in KCON. When I configured the system, 
KCON, I identified it as C meter number one. So KCON keeps track of everything you have attached to the instrument. And then I can come through and I've got all these different inputs that I can set, start, stop, step, but I don't know what these inputs mean. So if I scroll down here, I see that the person who actually wrote this code very nicely documented it for me and described what all the inputs and outputs are. So this is a well-written C routine for a user test module. <clears throat> Can we do it inside of the current software? So the question is, um, do we need a separate C compiler or can we actually compile inside the Colt software? The immediate direct answer is it's all built into the Colt software. The compiler is built in, everything's built in. <clears throat> The C compiler is actually Microsoft Visual Studio and Microsoft does not allow us, or let me rephrase that, their licensing forces us to ship you Visual Studio. So we have it pre-installed on the system, but we also have to ship you the original licensing on it. Okay. So Colt takes the place of the Visual Studio environment. You have the full environment on there, but Colt is a shell that we've created specifically for instrument programming, and it actually programs in ANSI C, a very simplified C, and then uses the Visual Studio compiler. So if you wanted to drop into Visual Studio and use it, if you're that good a programmer, you're more than welcome to do that. The full system is on there. But here's the important thing for the system administrator. As of two weeks ago, Kite version 8 and later, we no longer ship Visual Studio standard. So if you order any more 4200s, you have to order Visual Studio as a separate option now. Now you can buy it from us or you can buy it from Microsoft or you can buy it from Egghead Software. But it, the compiler doesn't come standard anymore. So, so don't lose this compiler right here because it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> uh, you have a setup where you're doing an IV sweep and also a CV uh, Correct. sweep. Um, the IV will be through the SMUs whereas the CV will be through the CV. That's correct. Uh, we don't have an automatic probe shifter or switch. Okay. Like that. So would you recommend dropping all the probes in before measurements or do we change them or do we isolate the CVU from the SMU? Uh, how does that work? Okay, so to rephrase the question because I'm not sure my microphone can pick it up, you're basically saying we have shown here both a CV test and an IV test, which of course are two separate instruments and we put them, in our case, on the same device. So if you want to consider it, basically you have to re-cable from the CV to the IV between CV and IV here because you have no switch matrix. So you have to re-cable it. However, just because we attach them on the same device here doesn't mean they're actually the same device. You could have four probes on your system and have CV on these two probes and IV on these two probes and now go ahead and run the sequence and it'll test this device and this device. In other words, I've got no knowledge of your connection here. I assume you connected it correctly. Now, there's two ways to make that easier. One is, and I know that some systems here have a Keithley switch matrix. If you had a Keithley switch matrix, we would add a switch matrix closure between these and that would route the CV to the device or the IV to the device if you had the switch matrix. Um, this system doesn't. Okay. Keithley has just introduced a new product that we call the remote amplifier switch which is intended to work with our ultra-fast transient tester. 
This is a remote fast amplifier that also has the switch built in for IV and CV. So if you um, upgrade the system to the ultra fast IV capability, um, then the switch comes with that. And then you'll, it automatically switches between the devices. Okay. But the, the fundamental thing here is the system actually has no knowledge of how you're connected. So you have to make sure it's connected properly. Uh, if you could add to that, uh, how important is isolating the CV? I mean, can I tolerate some input signal to it if it's through this and you high voltage or if okay. a mistake that happens? Okay, so the, the, the comment now is how important is it that I isolate the CV? And there's a couple of answers to that. So the context here is maybe I have a four terminal MOSFET and I set a couple of probes down with SMUs maybe down on the drain and the source and now but right now I'm interested in testing CV from gate to bulk so I set a couple of probes down for the CV but I left the smooth setting there so there's two things that come up there first of all what sort of load does the SMU put on the CV meter it's dangling on the device and the SMUs when they're not used are at virtual ground so so the impedance, say, from the gate to the drain, the CV meter will be pumping some current into the SMU. You're not going to damage the SMU, okay? Um, but uh, it probably will not impact your drain, sorry, your gate to bulk measurement except for the fact by having a grounded drain, you've now shifted the actual electric field that your device is seeing. If the drain were truly floating, if you lifted that probe, that electric field would appear across the gate and the substrate. But now you've grounded the, the drain, now I've created an electric field across the drain. Okay, so I've actually moved where the electric fields are appearing in the device. That's very, very important to CV, to know exactly where the electric fields are. So to answer your question, it, it won't hurt the CV instrument. In fact, CV was intended to be used with these source measure units. So we anticipated somebody would leave an SMU, would turn it on to 200 volts, and the device would break applying 200 volts directly to the CV meter. It will not damage the CV meter. The CV and IV are protected from each other. You can't damage them with a failed device. But you do need to know where your electric fields are and how the IV instrument interacts with the CV instrument. The AC impedance of the SMU is a variable that's not predictable. The DC impedance of the SMU is predictable from the CV meter. So when the CV meter puts a DC bias from gate to drain, that DC bias, that electric field, will be there. But the AC, if the CV puts a megahertz on the gate, that megahertz has a really hard time. The SMU looks like a high impedance to that megahertz. The SMU can't respond. So it's kind of a high impedance pin. It's not stealing too much CV measurement. So, but remember, we're measuring the current on the bulk, so I really don't care how much signal the SMU is stealing. Okay, now, now tomorrow we're going to get into some details about how CV meters work, and I think this question will become clearer. So let me answer your question today just in the context of you cannot damage the instruments. The SMUs and the CV will not damage each other. Okay? You can take an outside 1000 volt source and tie it out there and now you can damage the instruments. But the internal instruments can't damage themselves. It's a great question. So I talked about how, whoops, let's get rid of this. Delete. I talked about library management here. So I've come along here and I've opened my two terminal miscap device, which opened both my uh, sequence manager and my library tool. I've created an IV sweep here that I think is unique and I want to keep it. And I want to keep it 
in my own library. So I come over to my test library manager and I see the only place I can put it is in 4200 KI user tests in one of these subdirectories or I can just submit it and it can go directly under that. So there's my IV sweep in there. Well, pretty soon this thing's just going to be a, a huge list of uh, everybody's tests. So what I really want to do is I want a Lee subdirectory. So I get a Lee subdirectory by coming up to Tools, Options, and select the Directories tab. And now I want to come down here and add a new directory. And this new directory is going to be located at C colon backslash S4200 backslash KI user backslash Lee. Add. Mm -hmm. Add. Okay. Now I have to actually, I believe I have to close this and reopen it. Now, uh, it created, actually, I, I did that incorrectly, but it created me a new subdirectory. I ignored the warning message. I, I'm bad about that. It created a subdirectory called KI user export. Okay. And so now I have a place that I can submit my tests down to. So now I can create my own libraries and have my own test submitted out to the libraries that I can drag into any project that I want to drag them in. Notice that I included the data when I submitted this test. Now one of the reasons I include data is often I'll create a test and I'll go create a formulator set of formulas to go with it. Formulator formulas require data. So I leave the data in the test. That way when I pull the test back in, it pulls in the old data, but it also pulls in the formulator formulas. And now when I hit the run button, remember the old data is thrown away, but the formulas are kept. So that's how I manage my formulator formulas. Question? Yeah. What is that UID for? So I am allowed to create multiple tests of the same name. Add a new test, IV, S-W-E-E-P, and it says a copy of this ITM already exists. Um, please choose a different name. Well, wait a minute. Let's read the whole error. If you're trying to create another instance of this, use the library management on this device that owns this test. Oh, fine. It used to let me do it directly. So I come over here to IV Sweep and I'm going to copy it. Kite says, this test already exists and there are changes pending. Please save the changes and then try this operating this operation again. Fine. So I'll come over here to IV Sweep and I click Save. <laughs> All right. Now I can say Copy. All right. So now that I saved the pending changes, what it says is, this test already exists. What would you like to do with it? Would you like me to rename the test, overwrite it, or cancel? And here's why it's asking me that. It's going to create a second instance of this test. And the only thing that differentiates these two tests is the UID, the unique ID. So I'm going to have IV Sweep 1 and IV Sweep 2. But these tests require that they have the same test parameters. Tests with the same name have to have the same test parameters. So it's asking me, do you want me to take the parameters from this library test and overwrite your existing tests? Or do you want me to give it a different name? Okay, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this new test in and I'm going to overwrite the old test. Now you're going to have two tests of the same name but I have to maintain their data and their graphs as independent entities, so I have to have a unique ID in order to do that. 
The concept here is called test rippling. So you can create a project where you maybe have multiple devices, but they're running the same test. And you say, oh, I really wanted, instead of three volts, I wanted two volts on this device. That two volts will ripple through all the tests. So it makes it very convenient to manage multiple tests. So we chose to allow tests of the same name and we put the restriction on it. They must have the identical test parameters, but they will have independent data sheets, data files, and graph files. Unique ID is how I identify that. Okay.